In the world of television, the people who make the big decisions tend to occupy the top floors. Right up there, from soap operas to sitcoms, their priorities are ratings, not realism. And when it comes to representing lesbians and gays on television, they know just how far they can go, which sadly isn't very far at all. The uninitiated could be forgiven for thinking that we do nothing more tactile than holding hands, and even then, with one foot firmly on the ground. Two people of the same gender are seen to be turned on by each other. They fear that the nation may well turn off, and they're probably right. The general public don't want it shoved down their throats, even if we do. British television's most controversial soap has previously made headlines for tackling such tough topics as suicide, assault and drug abuse. Yet the show's latest storm blew up over a simple act of affection. Guido, uh, in a scene, kissed me momentarily, near the lips. Um, there was a huge orchestrated telephone tree outcry. And the following day, it was discussed on open air. Anyone can fall in love. That's the easy part. You must keep it going. Now, the other week, Guido gave Colin a goodnight kiss. I said it didn't offend me, but it certainly did offend some of you. And here are some of your letters. First of all, Mrs. Letchford from Bricksworth in North Hans writes, I think it's disgusting. Rain, joy. The EastEnders' kiss is now public property. However, unpublicised clashes on the EastEnders' set tell a similar story. There was one famous case which um, I felt very, very strongly about when Barry decided to come out to his father. In the blocking of that scene, when you're putting it together in rehearsals, instinctively, I grabbed hold of Barry and clutched him to me. And we went on to record it, and down came a note that said, we had to cut out the embrace. And I, I asked why, and I was told that we couldn't shoot it that way. So I said, well, the job of an actor is to try and make it easier to shoot. Let's talk about it. And the bottom line was that really they wouldn't shoot it with the embrace because they said that embrace would never happen in a, an East End pub. And there followed a quite heated uh, debate with me saying that that was absolutely wrong and that they were judging this because Colin and Barry were gay. <laughs> On the other side of the Atlantic, another mainstream serial has suffered similar restrictions. Heartbeat is a medicated soap from the Aaron Spelling stable, the people who brought you Dynasty. Produced by ex Cagney and Lacey boss Alison Hock, the show introduced American television's first lesbian lead. The lesbian character is Marilyn McGrath. She's played by Gail Strickland. Nobody there can accept who I am. She's a nurse practitioner. She's a little older, a little wiser. She came out of the closet after, after a successful, on the face of it, marriage, after uh, mothering a child. He says he begged you to stay and to see a shrink. Yes. He wanted me to see a shrink who would cure me. Well, you could have tried. And her lover is played by Gina Hecht, who plays a uh, Patty. You're scared, aren't you? Yeah. Heartbeat presented the network with a unique problem. Just how far could a girl go? That's the question, how, how to present people who are lesbians physically. Uh, we are right now going around and around with, with ABC, which, which has been supportive on one hand. On the other hand, we're, we're having a dance scene, and it sounds ridiculous. Here's the two women who are dancing. First, we reassured them this is not slow dancing. God forbid that two lesbians would slow dance on television. Uh, it's fast dancing, and that, that really wasn't enough. We had to introduce another character dancing sort of with them, a man sort of running through it. I actually said to ABC, I said, well, think of it as the polka, I said. And they said, oh, polka, that sounds safe. It's going to be fine. It has to be. See, I don't think these characters will, will ever kiss. I mean, I hate to say that. It would be, it would be a shock to me in today's, today's networks that that could happen. <laughs> Hetero 
heroes on Heartbeat and, and all of network television in America do a, can do a whole hell of a lot more than lesbians can do. Heteros can be in bed, they can kiss, they can snuggle. As far as I can tell so far, lesbians can do almost nothing. They can hug in a friendly manner. They can't really be sexual toward each other. How powerful are the networks in deciding that? The networks are extremely powerful. They, they, we, we supply product, that is, television shows to the network. Ultimately, they decide what goes on on, on screens at, at home. They can tell you no. Networks can tell you no. Yes, and mean it, and they will, and they have. And they did. Last month, the network pulled the plug on the show. In the ruthless world of ratings, Heartbeat's poor circulation wheeled it from the maternity ward to the morgue. The BBC will be delivering the show to us sometime this year. Aaron Spelling Productions also created Dynasty, bringing you Stephen Carrington, Primetime Soap's first gay character. But the programme maker's own misgivings had a bizarre effect on Stephen's sex life. Ex-Dynasty producer Diana Gould witnessed the behind-the-scenes manoeuvring. When I came on the show, we had a, I thought, a wonderful storyline for Stephen involving relationship with a gay senator. And uh, it was a love story, and it was sort of structured like Romeo and Romeo. And I felt that watching that story, however you felt about gay people, you would have to be rooting for them to get together just from the story structure alone. But whatever year that was, Rock Hudson had just come out as having, ha having AIDS. I don't think he had died yet. I don't think anybody was aware when he was on the show that he had AIDS. Uh, people didn't really know the full ramifications. And there was a lot of fear, and there was a lot of perceived fear in the audience. And they kept pulling back on that storyline, and, and um, I, I felt it was a big mistake. I remember arguing that there, were, there was a gay audience that would feel very badly if this were diluted and and um, and if Stephen went heterosexual again, that I, I just didn't think that you could do that. And the feeling was, well, it's only 10% of the audience, and you know, this is a heterosexual country and a heterosexual audience, and that doesn't really matter. Whether gay, straight, or neutered, Stephen Carrington was still too vital to existing storylines to vanish. So the scriptwriters took it out on his male lovers. It wasn't specifically said that his lovers had to die. <laughs> But he did have, I think I accounted, with something like 75% mortality rate in his, <laughs> his lovers. This is just a theory of mine, but, uh, for example, they'll do roots or the Holocaust, they'll do blacks and Jews if they're, you know, being murdered. Um, there was big ratings for Roots because, you know, you have black people in slavery. There'll be big ratings for Holocaust because you see Jews being led into the ovens. And there'll be ratings for gay people if they're going to die of AIDS. If ratings, morality and executive apprehension place a straitjacket on lesbian and gay characters, how do they escape? One way of wriggling free is to work in a tradition of literary drama which explores controversial material. American-born playwright Howard Schumann scored big with Rock Follies. Since then, his work has repeatedly featured major lesbian and gay characters. The difference is that British television kept its tradition of drama going, and still does. Therefore, a lot of, of the most important issues and the best comedy and the most surrealistic kind of drama could be done within drama departments. You want our full massage service? Just the shoulders, thank you. You know, you're awfully randy for someone who hasn't had an erection in two weeks. When gay characters turned up, they weren't gay characters. They were my friends. They were people I knew. And people who worked with me uh, could never say, excuse me, you know, this is, as one American director once said, when I said I wanted to write a homosexual character, and he said, do you find that attractive? I don't just say, it depends on who plays it. Uh, no one has ever said that to me here, interestingly enough, in the sort of 15, 16 years I've been writing. There are no specific references to homosexuality in British television's current menu of do's and don'ts, though there are the catch-all categories of taste and decency. So what can heterosexuals do that lesbian and gay characters can't? 
Colin Shaw, Executive Director of the Broadcasting Standards Council, acknowledges the discrepancy. They can engage in, in sexual activity uh, much more, uh, I don't know what the, what the word is, I mean much more liberally, freely, frequently I suppose is certainly the word, uh, than, than homosexual characters do. Um, and that seems to me to be, I mean, what is taken for granted among heterosexual couples is quite clearly not taken for granted among, among homosexual couples portrayed on the screen. Rules and regulations aren't the only influences on lesbian and gay roles. The moral climate curtails behaviour as effectively as any committee. I think that there has been a change in the, in the public mood. I think the public mood has become censorious in all sorts of ways in, in the last two, three, four years. But, I mean, if you look back over history, these moods do come and go. And I think at the moment we're probably in a, in a, in a more censorious frame of mind as a, as a nation. And so far I haven't censored my imagination. I'm, I hope I don't have to. But think? I probably would be more careful now in the, in the characters that I create. Why? Because Why? I feel this, I would be extremely worried about playing into the hands of what is it, this enormously serious backlash and reaction uh, against homosexual men and women uh, at this time. The government's response to this backlash was the appointment of right-wing establishment figure Lord William Rees-Mogg as chairman of the Broadcasting Standards Council to monitor programme content. His recent pronouncement on lesbian and gays in television stated, there is plainly a difference between the ways that people react to equally explicit homosexual and heterosexual scenes and they can't, therefore, to my mind, be put on equal terms. Will this be the official future policy of the BSC? Obviously what the chairman says carries great weight. Uh, he is only, when it comes round the council table, he is only one among eight. Uh, and uh, there is then the advice of the officers which, which may be given. And I would be reluctant to judge what the council may do in future by what any of us, whether it's me or whether it's the chairman or any of those who of us at this stage who are trying to make policy should say. And I would much rather use suspended judgment on that. The danger, I suppose, is if we're allowed to keep appearing at all would be a right on this that might create uh, a kind of blandness. Uh, and you might get characters who are so right on and sensitive that they just pale away in, into nothing. In 1987, Mindful of its statutory responsibility to audiences not catered for elsewhere, Channel 4 commissioned a gay sitcom. The Corner House was an extraordinary series set in a cause-ridden cafe patrolled by Gilbert, its right-on owner. More soap box than soap opera, it lasted an entire six weeks. There you go. And uh, in case you're interested, um, that's uh, Lesbian and Gay Switchboard, Nicaragua and Star. Marvellous. Well, we mentioned everything. We've got everything in Nicaragua to the need for creches, South Africa's thrown in, everything. I tried to get Palestine in, but we thought, well, maybe that's going a bit too far. Well, my knowledge of stereotyping is limited, but judging by the filth on the walls, anyone would think you're all puffs. Some of us are, Mr Cobham. What was the critical reaction? It was very mixed, you see. I mean, for example, the gay press loathed it almost uniformly. Uh, actually, Mr. Cobb, we've already got some artwork that we've put up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, and it really challenges the stereotyping forced on men and women, which is more our cup of tea in the corner house, actually. Now, if you have a character, you know, you don't have someone on Coronation Street end or whatever. You don't have somebody saying, who's that old woman? She's not like my Auntie Hetty. Get her off the screen. But if you have a gay character who's saying, I don't know him, I can't identify with him, What's, what's he doing there? There's tremendous responsibility. And everybody, because I realise, I do it myself. If you think something has gay content, you sit there glued and you're watching every move. Whereas if it was what you might call mainstream television, you wouldn't take nearly so much notice of it. You certainly wouldn't take it so personally. Are you saying that minorities can't be pleased? I think it's very difficult. <laughs> One programme that resolves such difficulties is Prisoner Cell Block H. The segregated setting absorbs lesbian characters easily into a captive criminal community where the idea of normal is armed robbery in GBH. This write-off location truly allows lesbians to get away with murder. Okay, who's a smart bitch that took my bra? Huh. But 
Who'd pity one? Who Ah, shut up. You're just jealous. Huh? Who'd want to be built like a cow? Oh, where are you off to? Got a bit of a headache. I thought I'd go and lie down for a while. Oh, well, look, if you're feeling sick, why don't you go to the shower blocks and try and make yourself chuck? I did wonders for me. The lesbian characters aren't brought in to, to make a particular point about lesbianism. I mean, obviously, with, with, with uh, a setting where you, you've got lots and lots of women of all different classes and ages and backgrounds and situations and crimes, um, you are going to get lesbians there. It's Wally. He just came to see me. He's such a nice guy. I don't want him involved in this. Is he your boyfriend? I think you better fill the kid in, eh? And because it's a prison system, it brings out this sort of rebelliousness, mm. Mm. which is always nice to mm. see in a woman. Mm. That's what Mrs. Davidson said, so I'll tell you the same thing. There's been a fraud committed involving the illegal use of official government documents, namely departmental requisition forms. And I thought this was all about somebody nicking stuff in the kitchen. Not somebody. You. Then why didn't you say so? He used to give me roses. With such a spectrum of positive images, and displays a fabulously aggressive dikery, it's no wonder lesbians have made Prisoner the biggest kitsch cult since Dynasty. But that was on the outside. If I miss it, I tell my friends what they say. I tell them, tell me what's happened or else. I have to tell me the whole episode in full. So don't start pulling any of your smart little delinquent tricks in here. Back her off, Mari, and leave her alone. Shut up and eat your dindins, Granny, or I'll take it off <laughs> you. Why don't you have mine? <gasps> okay, Mari. Call your heavies off. Right, I get lost. Oh, I think it's it's an example of living feminism that no good feminist should avoid, really. I mean, I think it's every feminist's duty to watch Prisoner Cell Block H and learn as much as they can from it. Thank you for being a friend. If women-only environments are suitable settings for lesbians, where better to find a dyke than amongst a commune of senior sisters in retirement? As long as she's just visiting, that is. We did a show, uh, a lesbian show, about the second season, I think it was. I don't think it was last season. They tend to blend. And it was one of our strongest shows. Lois Nettleton was nominated for a supporting uh, Emmy, which is our Television Academy Award. What I really want to say is I... I'm quite fond of you. I'm fond of you, too. <laughs> Our director got his Academy Award on the strength of that uh, show, and we had a tremendous feedback from it, from both the gay and the non-gay community. There's one other thing. Jean thinks she's in love with Rose. Oh, Rose? <laughs> Jean has the hearts for Rose. <laughs> I don't believe it. I do not believe it. I was pretty surprised myself. Well, I'll bet. To think Jean would prefer Rose over me? That's ridiculous. If we were younger, if the four of us were younger, saying the same things that we're saying now, there would be a salacious quality about it. There would be a, a shock value that we would be going for. Because we're all of a, of a given age, we have been around the track enough times to talk like that and, and to, to face issues that, that people face, and it puts a different light on it. Ma, did Jane sleep with you last night? Dorothy, there are a lot of things I want to try before I die. <laughs> but that's not one of them. I think the appeal for Golden Girls, for many homosexual men and women, is that, well, it is not literally about uh, a homosexual group of people. It has... Uh, an affinity to the kinds of situations and communities that a lot of us find ourselves in. I think it's a hoot. I think it's very well written. I also am aware that, that is part of all... I mean, I would say they're drag queens, to be honest, which I hope isn't too offensive to them, but, I mean, in gay men's mind, you know, it's, it's the funny auntie and, and the very sort of safe and very reassuring kind of humour. So why do you think that Golden Girls that managed to achieve such a huge uh, gay cult following? Gay cult, uh, I think, because we're funny. And I think, certainly, there's a rich, rich sense of humor. It's like a mother load that runs through the gay community. Uh, I think perhaps more appreciation of humor and, uh, and true-to-life situations than in the general 
community. And I think we tickle their funny bone. The man of Blanche's boudoir. <laughs> it's a calendar. <laughs> Each month has the picture of a man who's brought some special joy into my life. <laughs> oh, Blanche. Oh, honey, this is so thoughtful. <laughs> September. Yep. I'm surprised you were able to walk in October. And Golden Girls, in the end, you're safe. Um, good as it is at its best, even when it's at its best, because it is a genre piece, it leaves you feeling in a, with a full sense of security. It's very pleasant, and I think that's partly why we're attracted to it. These are pretty awful times, and it's nice to be relaxed and be soothed. But the best work in the most original work doesn't really soothe you. It wakes you up, it makes you angry, it disturbs you. And for that, you have to leave that kind of factory behind. Despite the limitations on even the most conscientious weekly comedy and the absence of sustained lesbian and gay roles, The Golden Girls is still today's most popular lesbian and gay viewing. A mutual partnership or a chance encounter? I think if we courted that kind of an audience, we wouldn't get them. It would be dishonest. We would be trying for something that uh, suddenly goes away when you try too hard for it. I think by just going straightforwardly along with what we're doing, uh, it's wonderful if we can pick up along the way, pick up a, a following. Honey, I didn't even know if you'd know what a lesbian was. <laughs> I could have looked it up. <laughs> people that I do know is against the gay rodeo, uh, not the rodeo itself, they're just against having the gay people around this community. I happen to be against it because it's a perversion. If it wasn't for the fear of AIDS, I wouldn't really care. This community is a cowboy community, there's a lot of farmers and ranchers and that would cause a lot of trouble. They really insulted the cowboys or the farmers in this town by calling them rednecks. We're a strong agricultural community and uh, you can associate that with uh, anti-gay. I don't feel that uh, I would make them welcome here. Uh, being retired military, we did tolerate that. We feel that there's gonna be a significant impact on the community. Uh, sanitation problems, uh, drinking water problems, law enforcement problems, traffic control problems, and, and you know the list goes on and on, and, and I think we've made a pretty clear record of it. I love the gay rodeo. We have such a good time. We originated it here in Reno in 74. And uh, it started out very small and got bigger and bigger and bigger. Out of the big events that Reno has, the gay rodeo, when it was going its strongest, brought in more money for the cab drivers, the casinos, the hotels, the bars, the shops here in town than any of the other, the straight rodeo, the air races, any of them. So actually, the people are cutting their own throats. 
I traveled for 12 hours yesterday. I've had rocks thrown at me, bottles thrown at me, people flipping me off, run off the road, and the hassle with the police. We don't deal with this type of attitude even in Bible Belt, Kansas. I think they're just strictly homophobic out here, and, and uh, I don't think they understand what we're here for. We're out there to ride. We're out there. We're good riders, and there's no reason we shouldn't be able to ride. But they think that because we're gay, that we're not supposed to be able to. People in the community have said, I will stop you simply because you are gay. And I think the DA will be hard put to say that it was not because they were a gay group. Well, I, th I think it's an infringement on our rights. And I think uh, having the ACLU behind us and they're going to handle the case. So I think, I think they should take it you know, as far as they can. I don't think it's going to have a big effect on International Gay Rodeo because we're going to go on and we're going to rodeo and we're going to continue with this organization. you're lurking. I've been wondering, why would a straight woman go to a gay bar? Well, presumably to get out the house, have a drink and enjoy herself. Of course, she won't meet Mr. Wright there, but not everyone wants to meet Mr. Wright. And uh, I suppose the occasional gay misogynist is preferable to the unwanted advances of a tanked-up heterosexual. Still, what would I know about it? I'm neither heterosexual nor female. Quel surprise. Good evening. Bonsoir. My name is Greta Lamour Miss. I run the upstairs bar in the paddock, which is now known as Grotty Greta's or Greta's Grotto. I'm Stuart and I'm gay and I go out with girls. <laughs> I'm Davina and I'm not a fag hag. I'm Debbie. I'm from Newcastle. I'm a lesbian. I was quite heavily involved in the gay scene, but I'm not anymore. Hi, I'm Adrian Gard and I own Rock Shots. In Newcastle, we operate Rock Shots Nightclub and also two pubs by the name of Rockies and the Courtyard. My name's Beverly. We come to Rock Shots every Saturday night, although we're not gay. Hi. I'm Beverly Hills, and I'm a bored Hollywood housewife. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm gay, and I run a pub called Strings. I don't run it, I own it. <laughs> <laughs> Something about a straight woman that makes you feel safe, makes me feel safe. They obviously enjoy the company a great deal, that they're not gonna be hassled, they're not, you know, they, they can come out with a gay man and, and have a good night. They're not gonna be run after and, and things like that. They can they can enjoy themselves. I definitely get on much better with women. I feel more relaxed and I have a better laugh and just generally much prefer women to men. <laughs> I should be straight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they come in because they like the atmosphere, they like the gay boys, 
not necessarily trying to get them into bed, but they're just like to be seen with them. They like a good time. And just basically they can relax easy with them what they can in a straight bar. Well, when we used to go out together always, it was every weekend, Friday and Saturday, mm -hmm. um, you know, night out, proper routine. Kind yeah, of it was a ritual. Ritual, yeah. In, in my bedroom yeah, it was and my mum's house. Tina's house. And uh, there was a, the ritual of me having a bath and a face pack <laughs> and uh, arguing who was going to do the ironing. It and was then, usually me. <laughs> and uh, and then a bottle of wine, a yeah. couple of cans of Carlsberg or something like that, and getting ready for the night on the town. Certainly they don't get the sexual harassment that they might get in straight clubs. Um, and also they, you know, perhaps can get away with wearing clothes in rock shots that they wouldn't get away with in, you know, places like Mecca night clubs. I don't know, you can't relax in the pubs in Newcastle. You feel like people are looking at you all the time because you look different. <clears throat> and um, when, when you come to rock shots, they like, respect you for being individual rather than laugh at you, you know. I do have straight women friends, yeah. Man, they might be all convicts, but they're the straight. Oh, what do I think of gay men? I love them. I love them. Ah, uh, they're gorgeous. They're handsome. They're every woman's dream. Every woman's dream. They live out their fantasies. They're gorgeous. The way they dress, the way they behave. They're very elegant. Very elegant. I think a more common experience is the fact that a so-called straight man will come to the club for the first time with a female friend or a female girlfriend and after a short space of time um, the girl will no longer be there and he has the confidence to come into the club by himself. I've used Davina as a cover before as a girlfriend figure. Um, <laughs> as, um, particularly I think in places where you go where it's like a quite a straight atmosphere not for a fear of people chatting me up or anything like that, but from a point of view of just if I feel slightly threatened mm. in a place, it just sometimes feels safe, do you know what I mean? I mean, I'll have, I'll have done... And it's quite easy to flirt with each other as yes. well when you're not, you know, and there's nothing yeah. vested in it at all, you can <laughs> get into it. <laughs> and I think I will have definitely used you as a cover oh, you for... Have, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but for the reasons that Stuart was saying, for this sort of security in sort of quite yeah. threatening environments. Environment. My mum, she never says, oh, you're going to rock shots. Never like that. She'll say, oh, you're going to rock shots tonight. <laughs> She'll, like, because she knows that I'm not gay, so she doesn't worry. I think she would worry more if she thought, oh, no, what's happening? <laughs> oh, <laughs> what you doing there? <laughs> Who's she picking up? <laughs> but she knows that I'm not picking anybody up when I come here. I think she's glad in a way. <laughs> yes, I've attempted to straight uh, to chat up a straight woman in a gay nightclub on a few different occasions, none of which I proved successful. <laughs> His dad. Um, they took the drink, and they took the tabs, and then bug it off basically. <laughs> there was that time in the Casablanca. Yeah, as well. in the Casablanca one night, and uh, there was a very handsome man. Then, who I had my eye on, <laughs> and uh, he, he he came over to the table to where we were sitting, and I really thought that we were, look was in. I was getting very excited about it, and he came over and started to chat up Stuart, <laughs> <laughs> and Stuart was very smug about it. Yeah, I probably was. You were very <laughs> smug. I remember once I came in with this really gorgeous man, and I thought, oh, he's really nice, and we're talking, and then he turned around and said, oh. You see, that? Oh, do you want to meet my boyfriend? And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> I thought, this is it. <laughs> you listen, I think it's so nice, the video. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Fag hags is a term that, uh, I don't know where they're well, they getting the, the name from, but we have a lot of girls that come in here that hang around with the gay guys. Um, I don't know what the, I don't know if it's just being inquisitive or they feel safe. Um, with the gay guys, you know, they know there's there's no trouble of somebody leaping on them and you know wanting to sleep with them or or what have you. But uh, we get quite a lot of straight girls that come in here. I don't like the term fag hag at all. I mean, I think it's just a horrendous. I mean, I can't. I'm Stuart's friend. <laughs> <coughs> if that's what you want to call me, call me a fag hag. But you won't walk out of this dressing room. I'm telling you. <laughs> I like 
to appear on stage every woman's dream and every man's dream. So uh, as the perfect woman, almost perfect. There are two styles of drag. There's glam drag, which is like Miss Beverly Hills. Um, we, the guy is beautiful, they call him Paul, and he's really nice, he has his makeup on nice, he's so tall, and he looks like a woman, but he, he is a guy underneath, he doesn't want to be a woman. And then you've got the funny side, which is Greta, which is really funny. He is like the, the comedy side of drag, which, um, he's got an answer for everybody. I mean, you can get a nice, handsome young boy dragged up, looks a thousand pounds of drag, looks absolutely fabulous, but no personality whatsoever. Then you can get an old boiler like me, put on a cloth cap, and just stand on stage with a bit of slap on, and I'm fabulous. Why do I think drag is popular? Um, God, I really don't know. I honestly don't know. I mean, does every gay man want to be a woman? No. I mean, it's crazy, really, because gay women, when they see it, seem to enjoy it. The ones that I have confronted seem to enjoy seeing a man imitating a woman. And yet, a gay man tends to draw back from you if you suddenly tell him you're a drag queen. Well, I think some lesbians like drag basically because it's, it's part of the scene the way it always has been. It's part of the, the gay, you know, it's underneath the gay umbrella, if you like. It's part of the culture. But also, I think a lot of them don't know any better. I think a lot of lesbians do like what they see on stage. Um, I mean, they come backstage and they talk to me afterwards and, oh, you, you know, you looked gorgeous and I wouldn't mind getting into bed with that sort of thing. But um, I don't know whether it's just their fantasies, you see. Again, emphasising that I do a glamorous act and what the women are seeing is a very smart, very quick-witted woman. Lesbians, they go for the fun of it. The ones what don't like drags drag acts or anything like that, they usually get up and walk out five or ten minutes, a little silent protest. I mean, it keeps them out the BBC studios, doesn't it? I don't like drag. I don't like it at all. I think it's a height of bad taste. Unless they're good. Unless they're good. Then I'll, and I'll applaud them. Does drag degrade women? I think women degrade drag. Have you seen them? You come in here, you've never seen so much acrylic and crumpling on women in my life. I like drag, and that, that's why I go down. I'll, I've got two of the bar staff that do drag as well, and uh, I'm sort of the manager. We take them all over. It's entertaining. I find it's very... You, you can get very bo bored uh, watching drag as well, if it's the same old routine of Shirley Bassey and what have you. But when it's entertaining, when it's funny, it's really good. It's, um, it keeps me amused. Like I say, I don't find it offensive at all. And I couldn't relate to it, and I couldn't find it funny, because, especially because he was in a gay club and he was, you know, wearing women's clothes. And he got worse and worse, and the jokes got more and more offensive. And in the end, he stopped the act altogether and parted his legs and took from between his legs a nappy, like a, a kid's disposable nappy, covered in tomato sauce and threw it into the crowd, which, I mean, it was just sick, really. It was my idea of, like, sick. And I got really offended and I got really pissed off with him and I went up and thumped him. I would never insult a woman on stage. My mother was in show business and she taught me never to insult my audience. Now, I can make jokes about parties of people, but I would never pick out somebody in the audience, especially a woman, when there's a man standing in front of her, probably looking ten times better than she does. How dare I insult that woman? <laughs> Uh, lesbian and gay men mix very well in strings. Uh, we have one half as lesbian land and the other half all the gay guys. But otherwise, uh, it's a good mixture, it's a good balance. The gay men, you know, have a lot of straight women around them. And uh, the lesbians tend to stick together with their, within their own little cliques. Do you know what I mean? Not, like I say, on the boundaries of things, not actually involved in the whole scene up here. I think it's. I think I'm particular. I'm, I'm more friendly towards heterosexual women. Um, I'm surrounded with them. I have a lot of heterosexual friends. Um, gay women, I tend not to socialise with. Not that I don't want to. I just. I don't know many of them that well. You know, for instance, at Rockshots we do a men only night. Um, it's very very popular. Um, whereas 
if someone was to say, well, why do you not do a women-only night, I would honestly have to answer that I wouldn't have a clue what to do. I wouldn't like to run a pub for women at all, not, not entirely for women, because, um, for instance, we just had a, the place decorated, you know, we have a place done right through, and every time there is trouble or the, the wallpaper or something gets ripped, it's all ladies' toilet. We've had two toilet seats stolen. We have um, sponges put down the loo, so that it blocks the, the pipes. And we have to have the, you know, the sunny guys out every weekend. Um, but it's mainly the girls that do cause the trouble like that. You know, the, the guys' toilets you, you never have any trouble with. I don't mind seeing gay men kissing. It doesn't really bother us. Unless it's somebody who I like or anything, do you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it depends who it is. I don't really mind. But I don't like seeing lesbians kissing. I don't know why, I just, it seems weird. A lot of problems arise in the toilets in the fact that a lot of, of gay girls try to chat up the straight girls um, and I don't really think that a lot of the straight girls can cope with the situation. I mean it's dead easy to make the mistake, do you know what I mean? It's once in a blue moon that I'll have the ability to chat anybody up and you can guarantee that it's either a bloke in drag or it's a straight woman, you know. I haven't had much luck, really. I remember one occasion a young lady came up to me and she said, that, you know, you should like to buy me a drink, but uh, I managed to get out of that one. I had to go into the gents' loo to get away from her, you know. I told her I was drag. <laughs> she believed me. That's what hurt. Well, the first time I got banned from rock shots, it was because I punched a drag artist. I mean, I didn't thump him hard, I just thumped him, but I guessed that it would be me who, you know, get it in the neck, so I just walked out, and as I walked out, the bouncer was on his way to get me. And I just said, it's all right, I'm going. And he says, well, don't bother coming back. Which meant, don't bother coming back. So I left and didn't go back till the next week in a wig. <laughs> and I've never been so nervous in my whole entire life as walking up those concrete steps with a wig on that just felt like I had, you know, <laughs> back of a coal on my head. And then the door opened at the top. And the same bouncer who'd barred me answered the door. And he had a pair of shoulders like the time bridge and filled out the whole of the, the door frame. And I just put my head down. I couldn't look at him. And he says, are you coming in, Pet? And I looked up at him and I says, you know, I just nodded. And he said, uh, how he says, I know your face. And I says, uh, dos cafe con leche, por favor. And he went, oh, yeah, all right, then, good, I'll get in. Which meant, you know, go ahead, young lady. So I went, I went to the desk and I paid me money. And I was like that excited about being able to pass the same bouncer that had barred us in the first place. I ripped off the wig and said, thank Christ for that! And went running in onto the dance floor before he could catch us. So that's how I, I never actually recovered from that night ever. It'll be imprinted on my memory for the rest of my life. <laughs> The last thing people with AIDS really need is a shortage of things like proper food or enough heating. But recent changes in the British welfare system means they're having difficulty in, in claiming such vital things. In the last report of this series, Out on Tuesday looks at the hardships which have resulted and the political choices that we now face. Where is the help going to come from? The government? Charities, the people. Where is the help going to come from? In New York, people with AIDS can be seen begging in the streets. Recent changes in the social security system may be pushing Britain in the same direction. Exactly a year after those changes came into effect, a report published today shows people with AIDS have lost up to 65% of their weekly incomes. The changes in the benefit system have been particularly hard on people with AIDS. Dietitians estimate that they need £30 a week for a special high energy diet, yet special payments for heating and food worth £40 to £50 a week have been abolished. These were especially suitable for people with AIDS because they experienced constant fluctuations in health. The new system replaced those payments with a much lower level of income support. 
The old system of supplementary benefit was one of building blocks, one where if you had a specific disability or a problem with your health, there was something there to help. And you could have as many or as few of these benefits as you needed. For instance, if you needed extra heating, an amount could be paid for that. If you needed uh, the cost of a special diet, that would be met by the Department of Social Security. All of those have gone since last April. The system does not allow someone to become ill, become healthy, become ill, become healthy. It's always you're sick and you're sick until you're, di until you're dead, or you're sick and you get better and you go back to work. There's, or you're sick and you're always sick. There's nothing there for people who have AIDS, who are ill and get better, ill and get better. People with AIDS are forced to make very hard choices between whether they eat the kind of food that their doctor has told them to eat, whether they keep the heating on all day, as the doctor may have told them to do, or whether they pay the bills and keep paying the mortgage. The choices are often as simple as that. But when people with AIDS try to claim from the welfare system, they often face hostility. The woman over the counter screamed at me in a room of 30 other people sitting behind me. What gives you the right to come here as a gay man who's got AIDS and expect us to house you? And I thought, oh, and fled from that office doubly, doubly quick. If you feel you have been discriminated against on grounds of your sexuality, there's never any way in which you can put that case clearly and to anyone independent around what that means to you and ask for a fair hearing. Also, if, for instance, you have a lover of the same sex who is receiving benefit and becomes too ill to claim that benefit themselves, the fact that you are in a same-sex couple will give you absolutely no rights. You may often find the phone slammed down on you. In the context of HIV, the classic um, example for us as gay people is that gay men, uh, bisexuals and drug users are all seen as undeserving because they, in terms of, of government policy or in government thinking, brought upon themselves um, the illness. We chose the pink triangle as part of ACT UP symbol because, not only because it's a very powerful image, but also because it's got a very strong sense of history and meaning for the lesbian and gay well, community. And we feel that it's very important that the, that the pink triangle is up front in that image because of the homophobia that's been generated around AIDS and the AIDS crisis. The gay community has been the driving force behind the growing network of AIDS charities and information services. As the benefits crisis pushes more and more people in their direction, their resources are stretched to the limit. The strength of the voluntary sector has always been creative thinking. The ability of organisations like THT to look at a problem in a new light without the constraints of perhaps a local authority or a statutory service. Less and less are we able to do that. Our function is becoming much, much more one of maintaining people with AIDS and looking on a daily basis at ways of keeping them alive with cash. We want to be involved, we want to provide services, but the extent to which we can do that is limited by our own personal resources, um, whether that be time, whether that be pure physical energy, um, or whatever. It's not going to meet the demand on a national basis that only a coordinated statutory provision can actually do. The welfare of people with AIDS is counting increasingly on the amount of money that the gay community is donating through collecting tins. This shouldn't be the case. Today, the Terence Higgins Trust and other agencies presented their report to the Minister for Social Security, Nicholas Scott, and the pace of public protest is stepping up. In that sense, ACT UP wants to kind of make as broad a coalition as possible so that we can involve disabled groups, we can involve all the different groups that are campaigning around benefits to collect as powerful a group of people together to basically tell the DSSS that they can't get away with it. The support is there and it's overwhelming and we're all very grateful for it. But yeah, I, I do feel that we should not have to be reliant on people giving money. The state takes taxes from people. Those taxes are to look after the needy. It should be, it should be that way. It shouldn't be where we're looking upon charities to keep people alive.